that we, you would like. Um, I will send out a follow-up email that includes all the resources shared today. And let's see, I just want to tell you a little bit about CAP, Colorado After School Partnership. Um, we are working to um, create partnerships across the state um, with the goal of improving um, our after school and out of school programs across the state, uh, making them available for all youth. And we are part of the 50 statewide after school network, which um, lets us get in touch with people across, this, um, across the US and learn about their programs and share resources and, net and network with them. So it's a really wonderful resource to be able to connect with people across the state around their after school and out of school programs. And this is our focus, policy and partnership, sustainability and quality. Um, and we have all sorts of ways to get involved if you're interested. Um, at the end, I'll be sharing a link for that. All right, and today's speakers, and um, Valerie's gonna go ahead and facilitate the rest of the meeting. So Valerie, you wanna go ahead and get started? Yes, so I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to this Coffee with Cap on, and especially our first presenter, Christopher, and Chris, I forgot to ask you, is it Nitsi? It's Nitsi. Nitsi, okay. And you go by Chris or Christopher? Chris is fine. Chris, okay. Well, Chris joined the After School Alliance in August of 2018 as the Director of STEM Initiatives. In this role, Chris works to advance federal, state, and local policy to expand access to high quality after school and summer STEM programming. Prior to joining the After School Alliance, Chris led the policy and advocacy work of the New York State Network for Youth Success. New York Statewide After School Network. Chris also worked for the Maryland Science Center prior to his work in New York, delivering STEM programs to students in school and in after school programs across the Mid-Atlantic region. Chris, thank you again for starting today's conversation. Absolutely, and, and thanks for having me. And, and hello from, from the East Coast, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Chris Knights. I'm the director of STEM initiative at the After School Alliance. Uh, so I, you know, previously, I think it was mentioned by Valerie, I, I work for the New York State Network. So the New York Statewide After School Network. So I've got a good idea of, of what, what CAP and some of the other state networks across the country are really working to do uh, with after school in, in their respective regions and states. Um, so hopefully I can provide a little bit of that context as well and, and work that in throughout this kind of presentation um, slash conversation. I think we like to approach these as not just presenting, but also having conversations and trying to share out as much as possible. So I am going to share my screen and hopefully this works. All right, does everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. So a little bit about the After School Alliance. Uh, some folks are probably a little bit familiar with our work. Some folks might not be. So for those that aren't, we are a national organization that's located in Washington, D.C. And we work with the 50 statewide after school networks along with different after school programs. We have uh, after school ambassadors uh, all across the country. I think we've got 200 plus alumni of the after school ambassador program. And those are folks that are working with it within after school or a school district to really help facilitate and improve quality and access to after school. Um, and then we also work mostly at the federal level with Congress, but also the Department of Education, some of the other federal agencies that oversee different programs that support after school and school age programs and summer programs across the country. So we kind of have three different approaches to the work we do. Field building, so helping to make sure that, that folks on the ground are equipped with, for the most part, advocacy materials to help them make their case to their school districts and their state legislators and their federal policymakers, um, but also helping to make sure that they have access to different curriculum and resources that are that are out there. Um, we also do research and that is mostly in the form of the America After 3 p.m. survey and some folks might be familiar with that. That's the really the only national survey that's done. It's a household survey to parents to really capture the access to programming across the country and broken out by state and then sometimes within different regions and, and cities within states. And we actually are getting very, very close. It's very exciting, getting close to releasing our 2020 data. And that'll be released later this fall. 
Uh, and actually later today, we have our first kind of glimpse into that data to see with the research to see kind of how things have changed since 2014, which was when our last survey was done. And then last but not least, the policy and advocacy and communications tools that I'm going to talk specifically about here in today's kind of conversation. But first, I want to give you some quick background. So I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Um, a quick background kind of on what's happening in DC at the federal level and how that could and hopefully in some ways will impact after school access in Colorado and all across the country. So hold on, I actually, since I'm the, the host, I'm getting these waiting room notices. So I'm going to let people in if that's okay. Uh, so we have two more people that are, that are joining us uh, in, the, in the actual Zoom meeting. So I'll, I'll try to manage that while I do this as well. So a little bit of multitasking here. All right, so a little bit of background on, on what's happening in response to coronavirus slash COVID-19 uh, slash the pandemic at the federal level and how that's potentially impacting programs on the ground. All right, so here is just, a, I don't wanna read this off because it's a lot of information, but essentially what it shows is there's four different bills that have come out of Congress to really support a multitude of, of businesses and sectors across the country in education systems as well. So we've got a lot of funding that's going out to hospitals, a lot of funding that's going out to businesses and small businesses in particular through the payroll protection program, uh, which is obviously is something that, that after school and summer nonprofit organizations can try to take advantage of if, if there's any funds available, right? So what we've heard is once that really came out in, in March, uh, there was a lot of demand for it and they had to, Congress actually had to put more money within that program because there was just so much demand for the payroll protection program. Um, but I do want to key in on this third bill here because this is the biggest bill and it's the one that kind of applies to to what we're talking about when it comes to to federal funding and, and, and support of after school and summer programs. Um, the CARES Act is what we what's been it's been shortened from Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act to the CARES Act. Uh, this was over a trillion dollars in funding um, with a good amount of that going to, well, a good amount of that, a small percentage, but it's still a good chunk of change going to, to education. And so that's kind of the four, and in the next slide here, I'll kind of dive in a little bit more around the education funding from the CARES Act and how it's being used to support after, or can be used to support after school and summer programs. Um, what we don't see here is much happening since, really since April when, when CARES 2.0 was passed. There's been additional payroll protection program legislation that was passed earlier this month, but that's really a small um, subset of kind of the overall focus of what Congress is looking at. So there hasn't been a lot of action since, uh, since April, and we're hoping that will change come this next month and, and pretty much after the July 4th holiday. And I'll talk a little bit about, about what's being looked at in Congress as well. So, this is kind of just the quick synopsis of the elementary and secondary school relief fund. This is the education funding that was within the CARES Act, uh, $13.5 billion. So, you know, it's a small percentage of over a trillion dollars, but it's still a good chunk of change. Uh, and it's money that goes to the state education agencies, then also the local education agencies, so the local school districts to, to support, and it's pretty flexible to support education uh, in their local communities. And we were very successful and getting language in there, and, and again, getting language is one thing, right? And getting it actually implemented at the local level is another thing uh, around planning and implementing activities during the summer and after school. So we were successful in really making the case to Congress that, that these funds need to be flexible enough that, that folks that might need to be running summer programs can actually have some funds to hopefully support their local community-based organization to run summer programs for the school district. Now, in reality, that looks totally different all across the country. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of school districts really kind of not really branching out and partnering as much with some of their previous partners. We've also seen other examples where school districts in, in certain states, California is a good example, where the, the state leadership is really encouraging school districts to really partner with those CBOs to make sure that you're supporting the whole child there, right? So not just, you know, a, a child that's in there for a few hours during the school day, or, or summer school, but also the other types of support that a, a CBO or community-based partner, such as a summer learning program can actually support. So and I, I believe these slides will be available later as well. Uh, so I don't wanna read off of all of this, but, but really there's a lot of money that was put in to CARES 1. Um, 
to really support education, very flexible in its use. And any sorts of other funding that's going to come out is probably going to be similar in how flexible it can be used. Congress has not like to dictate to the states and the local school districts on what exactly they should be utilizing this funding for, which means it's going to be sometimes difficult to make the case that this should be funded or this should be used to fund after school and community partners that are working in conjunction with the school district. But it's not impossible. Another piece of this was the child development or child care development block grant. Uh, a lot of folks, if you if you don't use like 21st century funding from your state slash the federal government, you might use uh, child care subsidy dollars. This is uh, additional money that was put into the CARES bill, $3.5 billion to support child care across the country, a lot for emergency and slash essential workers, um, but it's still available to be used by, by, by school age programs as well. And it really comes up to, it's up to the state on how they want to actually utilize these funds and sometimes even the local counties as well. All right, and then the last little piece, this is, this is kind of what Congress is looking at. Uh, this, the, the HEROES Act was introduced last month, almost, almost a month and a half ago, actually today is a month and a half ago, and passed by the House, uh, not really taken up by the Senate, but it's another huge bill of, of funding for all different types of sectors within our, within our government, but also in our society. Uh, $3 trillion total. Um, a good amount of that would go towards child care development block grant, but also another um, $58 billion for, for K-12 education. So that's about four times the size of the previous CARES 1.0 at, at $13 billion. The, the, the House, essentially the House Democrats were, were looking at quadrupling that funding to about $58 billion. Now it's really a non-starter in the Senate as far as these funding levels but it seems like there's been some support in doing another type of, of federal response. Uh, the funding levels will be significantly smaller than these. However, there should be funding there, especially as we start to look towards the fall and, and whether, depending on what state you are in Colorado versus others, what, what school's going to look like. Is it going to be resuming as normal or are we gonna have some kind of hybrid schedule or are we gonna be entirely virtual? There's a lot of money that needs to be provided to the districts to actually implement that. All right. And this is kind of just how we make the case. And this kind of transitions into to, to the why piece of, of the advocacy conversation, which is I think what, they, what, what folks wanted me to focus on here is kind of why am I coming to you and asking you to take part in these advocacy actions, right? So, so why advocacy? Um, if, if that's the kind of the question that's being posed, I wanna make sure that I stress how important it is for, for program stories to be told, um, especially in these times, you know, during, during COVID-19 and the pandemic, our society's kind of been, and our world's been turned upside down, right? But we've seen so many amazing examples from after school and community partners on how they've responded to these circumstances, whether it's pivoting to meal delivery or pivoting to virtual learning or getting tablets out to school or to students just checking in with students, figuring out, you know, what what issues are they having that they that you can support them in, in telling that story. So this is something that we take for granted and often in the after school field and, and even the human services sector. Like we do this work because it's our calling, right? It's something we just have to adapt. But legislators and policymakers don't always understand that, and that's why it's so important to make sure that we're actually sharing those stories on why you know, the after school field and the youth development field is incredibly important to these responses um, to the pandemic and also all the other types of tragedies that, that, that happen in our society. But we need to be able to tell that story effectively to our legislators and our policymakers. And we at the After School Alliance have kind of helped to try to create those tools for you all to, to share those stories. So I like to think of this as like an ecosystem. And this is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, especially in education. Uh, advocacy is almost an ecosystem. So there's different people have different roles in this greater, you know, advocacy role. So, so grassroots are the folks that are on the ground. So this is mostly everyone here that's on this call, whether you're running a program or you're working a program or you're associated in some way with an after school program or a summer program, you all are at the grassroots level. And then there's the grass tops, which I would say I'm more of a part of the grass tops where we're 
kind of at that, that the national level, communicating with members of Congress in their offices to help share the stories. So those two combined are incredibly important. It's kind of combining the anecdotes of what's happening in the programs with the data that's looking at it nationally and how important or how in demand after school is and how you know, the research shows how incredibly important it is to, to, to youth and, and, and children as well in the families. So that's kind of why it's important to tell these stories. So hopefully that I made my point about being engaged in this ecosystem of advocacy and, and really elevating how you're responding to, to whether it's COVID-19 or just youth demands and family demands in general, and making sure that, that the folks that are making the decisions on how they want to allocate funds understand how, how you're being able to support the, the, those families and, and youth within our current times. So like I said, we've created different resources and communications tools. Um, this is just a small list of it. Uh, and a lot of these are, are taken with a broad lens. So we're a national group, but we wanna make sure that we create, create tools that are, that are in, available to use by, by both statewide after school networks, so Megan and Valerie, but also programs as well. So this first one up here, and I don't think I have time to open up each individual one, but I think you know, sharing this out, this slideshow out will, will, will provide the links for you. But this first one is more of a, a sample letter or email that a, an after school program can actually use to customize, to share with their, their school district partners or potential partners on why it's important to, to think about after school when they start thinking about reopening schools in the fall or in some areas next spring. So there's a lot of those tools like that. Uh, there's an internal guide. So on COVID-19 resources, this is kind of looking at federal resources that have been been invested in, in education, but also um, other types of nonprofits in helping you understand a little bit. This is an intense resource. There's a lot of information in it, but it's kind of broken out into different sections. So if, if you're just looking for resources on CARES funding and how you can talk to your school district about CARES Act funding, there's sections within there. Um, there's also more details around why after school and summer programs are incredibly important to the reopening uh, in this handout, this third document here. And then the last one is, is everything's kind of framed around, all, all of these are framed around looking at, you know, reopening and, and, and the role that after school and community-based organizations can, can have. And they're kind of all framed with different audience in mind. So a lot of school district folks, but also um, state legislators and, and state policymakers at the, the State Department of Education, um, or even like your, your county or, or local school, school district um, to, to kind of make that case for, for why why you all should be at the table when it comes to reopening and planning for, for whatever our school district looks or whatever our school schedule looks like come fall. Um, these are just additional resources that we have on our website. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, but I did actually, Megan, did you want to share a, a few of those Colorado specific templates that, that were produced? Yeah. Um, can you, yeah, except that I'd have to have the host back. Oh, so, so should yeah. I just give a quick shout out about the, the survey? End. Okay. Yeah, so, survey. Uh, so as a national group, we try to, to kind of gauge what's happening on the ground. Um, at the program level, we've been doing this through surveys and we have a survey that actually today is the last day. So if you have not taken it, we, we definitely encourage you to take it. There's even um, a, a potential prize, I think a $25 gift card or cash prize. I think you get to pick which one. We only have so many of them. Um, but, I, but I think we have enough that, that a good amount of folks that, that submit a response to the survey will, will, will be provided with that. But it's a survey on kind of how you've responded to, to COVID-19 and, and what you're looking at in the future and, and how we can kind of take that and, and share that out with, with policymakers at the federal and even state level. Um, so I think Megan sent this link out before, uh, maybe on Friday, uh, and, we'll, and she'll send it out again. But definitely encourage you to, to take this survey if you can. I think it takes around 10 to 15 minutes, uh, but your responses are incredibly important. I think Megan can even use some of these Colorado specific responses and some of the work that they're doing as well at the network level. Yes. So let me give you the power of oh, okay. the host, I think. Yeah. All right, did I give you the power back? Uh, doesn't look like it yet. Mm. 
So Valerie, or do, does anybody have questions for Chris or things that you'd like him to expand on? Well, um, I would encourage everyone, if you have not had a chance to um, go to the survey, and um, I know you're, you're very busy right now. Some are reopening programs and others are, are providing them uh, virtually. So, um, but we sure would appreciate if you would um, enter information into that survey because it is shared with also th the statewide networks. So it's very important for us to also see that information. Well, if there's no questions for Chris, I want to thank you, Chris, for starting today's conversation. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to a, a new person at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and that's Autumn Rivera. She is a research analyst in the education program at the National Conference of State Legislatures, where her areas of expertise are after school, summer programming and mental health. Prior to working at NCSL, Autumn worked as a program coordinator with Girls Inc. in both Santa Fe, New Mexico and Denver, Colorado. There she created and facilitated lessons for girls ages five through 18 around a broad range of topics. Autumn has an undergraduate degree in justice systems from Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri as well as a master's degree in applied human rights from the University of York in York, England. During and after college, Autumn spent her time working with children in a variety of set settings and is excited to be working with NCSL uh, pertaining policy. Autumn, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will yeah, I'll start with saying, um, as someone who recently got out of working with children, I applaud all of you who are still doing it and managing it in this difficult time because it is a real new challenge. And I know working with kids always provides new challenges, but this one is, this one's different. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background on NCSL just so just because it kind of helps out, I think, a little bit. So NCSL, we work with state legislators all across the country um, on a variety of topics, one of them being education. Um, all of the work we do is bipartisan. So what's nice about that is typically when people are able to use our work and all of our stuff that's available online and used for legislators, that's known for being reputable for those reasons. So it will, can benefit you guys in that way, which um, is is really helpful. So, um, we started hearing about the fact that after school pro programs were struggling getting legislators to be interested and concerned about needing funding. So about six years ago, NCSL started doing data grant projects with um, the Mott Foundation. So we provide um, technical assistance for these different states. So right now, I think we work with 34 states across the country um, because policymakers were asking for more data and not just stories. So they, they were excited to hear stories, but then they were like, well, what is this gonna do for me, my constituents, those kind of things. So we offered a way for them to do data. Um, you know, we knew that after the Great Recession, there was more money and therefore more room for, you know, fighting for after school funding and those different things. These data things can be a whole variety of things. A lot of them use policy maps and program maps. So what they'll do is they'll place it and they'll show you where all these programs are taking place. They'll show you how many children are attending, what these children are getting after that. And those are typically partnered with the um, America After Three survey. And so we use those in conjunction and things to, to you know, elevate some of those voices. And what's nice is that they can show different services. So ages served, service, you know, the, there's different overlays, ju juvenile justice. I know California is starting to um, add an overlay with demographics and Illinois is starting to do the same thing with concentration of poverty. So we're able to see different things and make different arguments for legislators that, you know, we haven't been making in the past. Um, as of right now, since, you know, like we said, the world's a little bit of a mess, California, or I'm sorry, legislators will be starting to go back into special session or not be meeting until, you know, again um, in the future. So what's important about that is making sure that we have the right tools for those conversations. So, um, 
you know, returning on investment, supply and demand, those different things. It'll be good to make those fundings since these conversations are going to be tougher with budget cuts and, you know, all the things that you guys already know in that capacity. Um, what's nice is that because of the America After Three survey, we can use that to combine with local new, like local policies and those different things to combine and have better education or like for these legislators to learn from. And so these will be looking at again once this America After Three, like Chris said, I think, you know, it'll come out in the fall. And so once that comes out, we'll be able to look back at these maps and add additional things for that. Um, when the world's normal, we do a couple other things that we do suggest, such as like sites visits and taking, you know, legislators actually to districts and being able to meet and see programs. You know, we recommend that's usually in the summer or the fall when things are a little less busy. Again, the world's wonky, but we do offer a lot of assistance in like how to schedule those, what kind of conversations you need, you know, what you're looking for, what you're trying to get out of that so that we can support people who haven't been able to do that in the past. Um, it's helpful because they get to ask questions, see things firsthand. You know, it's that eyes on kind of thing. Um, what's important too about the fall that we're trying to really make sure that a conversation is being had is making sure that program directors and site coordinators are in these conversations with legislators about reopening and what that looks like and those kind of, you know, getting that foot in the door a little bit is also helpful for other situations rather than just this, but always making the argument for after school. The different ways that we also encourage that and that we do that you can also see on our like on our website and different things that you can watch videos and different things. We posted interactive meetings, we post briefs, blogs. Um, we have both invitational and just all open meetings. We have webinars that are specific for specific legislators, specific types of programs. We currently have just done, we just finished a COVID-based education webinar series where you can go through and look. We have things on student mental health, you know, reopening, what is it like in the fall, those different things where you can kind of see um, like what we're getting out to legislators and what's also super useful for you guys to be able to take and give to your legislators and speak to them about that with, you know, the different things that we have. Um, we've been in lots of calls of talking about how much, you know, it's going to go back to opening with schools. So, you know, I think the la latest estimate we heard was $500 per child not considering after school costs. So we've been using that data to make sure that legislators are aware of the fact that there's, you know, the costs that are associated are there's data, you know, saying this, and this is still leaving out some of the data that, you know, is necessary for these people, um, you know, for kids to get back to school, for parents to get back to work, those different things that we've been able to offer. So we really lean on that data side, just because that's what policymakers seems to respond with the best and what we can help with the best. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we talked about Right now what's tough is like the school's not necessarily working with after school programs and even community spaces and looking for those kind of different avenues. And so we, like I said, we always recommend using our briefs and different things to be able to pass on to legislators and be like, this is, you know, this is the data we're seeing. This is what we've got. What can you do? So yeah, I think that's pretty much anything. If anyone has any questions. And I'm a quick speaker, so <laughs> I'm happy to repeat anything. <laughs> Autumn, um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the mapping in that because we were, uh, as Megan put in the chat box, CAP was a recipient mm -hmm. of one of those data grants. And right before COVID hit on March 3rd, uh, we had a meet and greet at the Capitol. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the big draw why we were able to speak to everyone was because we offered breakfast burritos. At <laughs> So um, we, we did have a lot of visits and was able to hand out a lot of information um, in regards to, we had not gone live yet with our mapping grant, but we, you know, we provided the link in that um, to it and just had some great conversations over burritos and coffee. And, um, you know, uh, I guess the big thing we wanted to share um, with our mapping at, at this point, we know we do not have every after school program. We are looking at comprehensive programs, but we also have had several that do not meet that definition. And so we're, you know, we're asking for anyone in after school programming and deciding how it should be placed on the map. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the big thing with our map is that it definitely shared uh, the desert area in Colorado, yeah. which Manny, you probably won't be surprised to hear this, but it was the Eastern Plains, um, um, definitely is a desert for after school programming. And so, you know, that's, that's great for the state legislators to see, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, 
definitely, you know, we know that over 80% of our youth population is along the front range um, with about 20% of our students um, residing in rural. But we also know that there's, you know, like a hundred plus school districts in the rural versus the very few school districts along the front range. So again, it's, we, we realize the difference in the ratio of students, but they, they have needs too in after school, mm -hmm. whether rural or in the metro setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what, like what works well with these maps too is it's great, like you kind of said, like for visual learners, it's, it's great to be able to look at it and say, okay, so we're really populated in these areas, but what's going on over here? You know, what do those kids need? What, what assistance can we provide through that and those different things, you know? Yeah, I can, I can share um, the link. There's, we have like the other, other states also their projects um, linked on there. I'm updating that right now with the most recent projects. So mm -hmm. more will be added in the next couple of days, but there's a way to, you know, to look and get ideas from other states as well, which I know we usually offer for um, like grant recipients to look forward to like, if you know, you don't know which way you're going to do it and stuff, but yeah. I'll, I'll just jump in and say that when I was in New York, I actually was part of a data grant from NCSL as well. And we actually <laughs> created maps with, yep. with the data from all the programs and we would do it by legislative district. And it was the most impactful way to get legislators to, to support after school, mm -hmm. whether or not they had programs, right? So if they didn't have programs, it showed why they needed to support this so that they could mm -hmm. get programs in their districts or funding for programs. And if they did, it was good for them to understand how important maintaining and, and expanding funding was for, for after school. So it was such a, an amazing advocacy tool. Um, and, and I'm so glad that other states, including Colorado, are, are able to get a, get a resource like that. Are there any questions for Autumn? Well, thank you, Autumn, for, first of all, for joining NCSL, but also for joining us today. Um, <laughs> of course. We, we appreciate all the information you had to share. <laughs> Thanks. So now we're going to go ahead to Sarah Johnson, and we just were speaking. Uh, Chris talked about um, the after school ambassadors um, that the after school alliance um, chooses, or uh, as a state network, we nominate uh, some every few years. And Chris, I'm not even sure how many years that is between states and that, but we are fortunate to have our after school ambassador. Um, uh, from last year. So now she is, I guess, called a former after school ambassador, and that's Sarah Johnson. And Sarah also fits into what we were just talking about these um, rural areas, and you know, there's those pockets of deserts because she's joining us as the Senior Vice President of Education and the Arts from Vail Valley Foundation where her areas of responsibility include Youth Power 365, the Villar Performing Act Center, the Gerald R. Ford Amphitheater, and the Vail Dance Festival. Her career runs deep in education, the arts, and law as well. She was general counsel and director of risk management for Augustana, College and has her JD from DePaul University College of Law and her undergraduate degree in human and organizational development from Vanderbilt University. During and after college, Sarah worked in education both professionally in service on several nonprofit boards and as a volunteer through her career. Sarah is going to give us the local perspective on how Vail's youth Power 365 communicates their stories to potential funders and other stakeholders. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. And I would say, um, and can, I'm assuming everybody can hear me, um, the After School Ambassador Program, I, just you know, an incredible resource. I would say well, I was robbed of our last visit to DC. Um, Certainly when we were planned to do that, this all happened. So our day on the Hill became, you know, a, a phone-a-thon from our various coffee table, you know, kitchen tables and, and the like. Um, but I will speak to that just a little bit in terms of 
communicating with um, our policymakers, legislators, I think it was um, a really rewarding process. We got the phone call that said, you're not going to Washington, um, but can you dedicate this day to make phone calls? And, you know, it just was, it was fresh, it was new, it was probably within the first couple weeks of our programmatic shutdown. And the, the ability to share what was happening grassroots, how, how are we getting lunches out? Um, what, what do programs look like? How are, how are services that happen at school, health, you know, um, social emotional counseling, some of the key counseling aspects that happen at school, you know, everybody thinks about, sure, math and reading are, are different right now, but how is, you know, how, how are we feeding our kids? How are we providing um, social emotional support? How are we connecting with the, the kiddos that we know we are their trusted adult? Um, so just peeling, peeling the layers back a little bit I think is one lesson that we learn to say it's really obvious to all of us that are providing the frontline service of, of the secondary impacts of closing a school and closing after school programs, but it's it it wasn't so obvious to other folks and whether that's um, People that are making making policies, whether it's to our funders. And so when I think about how we communicate now and and some of the lessons that we've learned, I would say the theme is, um, who are you talking to and go back to the basics. Um, we all know how we're feeling and it's stressed and it's overwhelming. And so I hate to say it, but sometimes you're like, well, what are my primary concerns? Um, and everybody gets a little bit, you know, clutchy. I think we go back and forth from really clutchy to what do we need to really collaborative and how can we work together in new ways. So, so a lot of the, you know, ups and downs and peaks and, and valleys of how we communicate seems to be a theme, at least here in Eagle County. Um, so that's, you know, I will just talk a little bit about kind of the, the going back to the basics um, and really being repetitive on your message. I think the communication that we're all seeing right now is is a million a million emails um, and our inboxes are perhaps more full than ever with people just you know firing off so so thinking about how can we look at that differently um, one of the things that we've done at youth power 365 has gone to sort of a slideshow really low budget um, and i will share that if i can figure out how to share my screen um, yeah, if you can hand it over to me, I'll see if I can share what we did just to show a snapshot of how we um, adapted. Pivot, I would, you know, Chris said it a couple of times and it's my favorite and least favorite word at this time because I'm tired of, of doing that, but it's, it's certainly accurate. Um, so let's see if this will work. Can you hear the music or no? So you can see, and you can um, take the screen back if you if you'd like. Um, but this was really it was a minute, you know, and, and we tried to show a little bit of what it looked like and what we were working on. And it was really short and something that we sent obviously to donors. That was more of a donor facing, thanking them for their support and letting them know what we were up to. Um, so kind of fits in the category of don't miss a good crisis in terms of your ability to communicate with donors. You know, we might have, we had some donors who had never um, 
I'll stop sharing, who had never, uh, well, let's see, okay, um, who would never watch a video otherwise. You know, they think they know us and they know our programs, but it was a chance to reconnect in a new way. Um, our development person, not our marketing person, put that video together just asking for, for pictures. So, um, so that was one thing that we looked at to say, all right, you know, it, we got a lot of good feedback from that. I think donors, one, appreciated knowing what was going on, and two, knowing we didn't spend a lot of money on it. Um, it, was, it was simple, and it was something that we just wanted to do to share, and it met people where they were. We're used to having a lot of coffees, you know, with our folks, inviting them to programs, and how can we bring programs to living rooms? So, so pretty obvious, but, you know, an easy thing to do, and I think, you know, you don't have to have a huge staff to do something like this, whether it's your middle or high school kid at home that can say, help me put this together, you know, um, look to, to new resources to who can help with, with your communication. So just rethinking about how to get in people's living rooms right now was, was something that we did and that video was one um, example. Um, I would say we also went really as a team back to the basics to say, who do we need to communicate during this time and how often? So taking the, the to step back and and relooking at our strategy and our calendar for communicating. So we you know divided it into groups. We saw yes, we have family stakeholders. What's changed for them? You know, do they still have? Are they still here? Um, we've we in Eagle County have had a lot of families move away. You know, job loss in a resort town has resulted in in quite a few families moving away. We won't know that exactly until the fall when we see which kids show back up to school, but anecdotally, we feel smaller. Um, so thinking about that group of stakeholders and how are we gonna communicate with them? Um, looking at, okay, what are our, our donors? And that comes in a variety of categories. Those are the very close to us that we can call and ask for help and those that we only see once a year at our huge fundraising event, which we're not having. And so how do we attack that group? Um, our teachers, our, our, our people that work in our programs part-time, how are we communicating with them? So we all have that list of stakeholders, but taking the time to say, who are they? How do we regularly communicate with them? And how has that changed? Um, which was a really good exercise for us to um, go through as a team, because it might be that, you know, in my role, I communicate with, with certain folks and, um, the program people, the front lines, are going to communicate in a very different way. In the video, you saw some of our magic bus teachers, our mobile preschool teachers, going into the into the mobile homes and dropping off totes. Well, you know what? They communicate via WhatsApp, and that's okay. You know, however you communicate, figure that out, and and work together as the team to say, well, what tools do you need if you communicate on? on WhatsApp, what's gonna be the, the best way for you to get the message across and to stay in touch with families during this time. Um, just a little side note, hopefully a comfort in numbers that a lot of our program staff was frustrated. They're like, we're not, our kids are not engaging with our programs after school and the numbers that we wanted them to. This goes back to the spring and like, well, as a mom, I would say, yeah, my kid was on a device all day and, and after school, I frankly wanted them not to be on it. So giving each other some, some grace to say, what are these kids facing and, and what are these families needing? And it, it's not gonna be the same for everybody. So I, you know, I'm not saying anything that's, that's new to the group. Um, but the last piece, um, as we turn back on in Eagle County and we, I think statewide, we're at various places of, of reopening, um, but it's pretty divisive, you know, where where we are with a group, 50% of our, our constituents saying, open faster, we want you to open faster. You heard the my other job, which is uh, performing arts venues that we oversee on the arts side of our mission. <laughs> and we've got folks that are like, you are reckless um, and you should not be opening and others that say, open faster, we need more. Um, and how, how as a team, how as a, a whole company, do we respond in that space? And I think um, in, in terms of school, we're gonna see it, whether we're seeing it with, with our camps and out of school programs, out of school time programs in the summer, 
and then, you know, come fall, we're going to see the two camps of, of folks. And there's probably more than two, but right now the two are really, really obvious of you told me to shut down and I'm just getting around to it and understanding that. And now you're telling me to reopen, you know, I, I don't understand. And, and so the two camps of, of comfort level and where people are is something to address. And then within that, certainly we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, differences by, by demographics. So our Latino community is very much, they were the last to come on board with, with staying home and locking down and wearing masks and, and likewise um, are the last to come back and to say, yes, I'm ready to send my kids to programs. So we are running in-person camps. Our rec centers are open. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing the need to communicate on a much more micro level in different ways to our different groups. So those, that's kind of the overview, but I'd love to open it, you know, on the conversation front to say, you know, does that sound like what other folks are facing? And if there's other suggestions for the group um, to talk about, I think that's what we're hoping for um, this morning. And um, I was just here to share a little bit about how we approached it in terms of, of taking a step back and, and trying to map out who we need to communicate about what and how. So with that, I'll see if there's any conversation or questions. I think I wanted to add on to that. Um, is what, you know, what kind of tools do organizations, do programs have right now to share their story? Like, you know, you came up with that wonderful video and I wondered if other uh, programs have that capacity to do that. Um, we at CAP did create, um, let me see if I can share my screen. We did create, let's see, you actually have to pass the, the host back to me, but I'll, um, I will email this out, but they're like one pager and two pager storytelling templates that a program can use where they can grab some pictures and some stories and some key, maybe some quotes from families about what they are doing right now. And we're gonna share that out. So if your program doesn't have people in your organization, like designers, you know, or marketing team to do that for you, then let us know because we'd be happy to help get them made for you. So I will share those out in a follow-up email. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the whole purpose of this is to be thinking about sharing your story. And if you don't have a strategy to share your story, start thinking about how you can, because it can go all the way up to the top around funding and influence some major decisions. Um, so yeah, yeah so that, that was kind of my wondering is like, do programs already have these kind of tools in place or do you have a marketing team? And if not, you know, let us know if you need help, let me know, and we'll see if we can get your story, your story shared out. And I would say too, I think um, we've all, these video calls, you know, the easiest piece that we've discovered, um, we had a, a group of our program leads get on and we had a conversation with each other and it was as basic as, you know, what's been your biggest eye opener and what's your biggest challenge? And we just recorded it and shared it with our committee um, so they could hear us talking as staff about what we're facing. Um, and we prefaced it by saying, we totally staged it, you know, and we were practicing and, and doing it. But, you know, we sent to our committee and said, hey, we just thought you might be interested in this conversation among our staff as to what we're, what we're doing. That was true. We didn't say we took a few takes and, and tried to polish it a little bit. Um, but to, to just Put it out there that hey we we just wanted to share this with you and it's really not you know it's not our marketing team stuff um but letting people know and i think you this is an opportunity to do things a little bit differently and to approach your folks differently and people we're finding are open to it and they're not expecting our typical level of polish it's a great idea I also thought of when you shared that wonderful PowerPoint and that that students could actually, that could be one of their projects is to put together, you know, um, their thoughts on 
um, the after school program and what it means to them and, you know, taking the and again, we're in a different world right now, but, you know, is there a way um, that even virtually if you're not in person yet with your after school program that you could um, utilize past pictures you have taken and supply those to the kids and then have them do these uh, a project around part and then you'd have a series of PowerPoints to um, to share out because it really was, uh, I mean, I just, I just thought, oh, now I know all about what's happening in Eagle County just from this one minute. Um, um, and, and you're right that we're, we're bombarded by emails, but this was a little bit different than having to read through um, a long list of accomplishments on an email or something uh, to, of informing your donors. Well, are there any questions for Sarah or Chris or Autumn? Well, Megan, oh, Kathy. It looks like, Kathy, did you want to share at this time? Okay, well, I'm going to let Megan finish up our Coffee with Cap for today. Okay, I'm going to do a share screen. Um, just wanted to show you what we did create, if, and we'll be sharing this out. And so um, it's just kind of an example of different, uh, a one-page example of how you could share your story. Um, and then I also have this other one here. It looks like this an example. Um, so I'll email out these templates and again if you want some assistance with um, creating it for your program. And I also did want to mention the survey again to please um, do the survey, share the survey with your um, colleagues, uh, the um, one that After School Alliance has come up with because that's going to collect national data that's going to be really helpful in um, as we open these programs and the needs that are there. All right. So, whoops, let's see. There we go. All right, so here's our final screen here. And this is some of the things that um, are coming up with CAP, the resources that I'll be sharing out. Um, we do have our next coffee with CAP on July 14th at 9 a.m. And that one is going to be with Annie O'Shaughnessy, who led our SEL trainings this month. She's going to do a question and answer session with everyone. So if you took that training, you can attend. Um, I'll be sending out more information about this to all the people that attended as well. And we're also going to have that recording available very soon on our website. And we're going to be doing some trauma-informed practices trainings um, in July, late July, early August. Um, we've got uh, another round of summer activity guides. These were created in partnership with um, the statewide network, and they've got wonderful um, activities that can be done at home or in person. And we also have a really great list of resources for anti-racism and equity education that we can, can be used in programs as well. Um, and then there's lots of ways to get involved with Colorado After School Partnership. Um, you can join our action teams, share your stories, like through the survey that we shared today, um, and also check to make sure your program is on our map and uh, join our email list. So there's my email. If you have any ideas or questions, um, go ahead and email me. And it's um, not showing up, Megan. Oh, oh darn. It's, uh, I just We're still on everything I just read. How about there that? There it is, yeah. Yeah, there it all is. <laughs> and I, Megan mentioned our action teams and um, because we do have um, After School Alliance and uh, NCSL and um, our our former after school ambassador. I just want to mention to anyone in Colorado that would be interested in joining our advocacy action team. And also you might be interested in our uh, professional development and events because something else that nationally occurs every October is lights on after school. And it's another time to be able to share your uh, stories in that and um, um, 
uh, get parents involved. Again, we don't know what it will look like, if it will be in person this year or if it will be more virtually, but um, this is a way to get involved with CAP and share your thoughts of, of how you, you feel it would be beneficial to um, have these events or av advocacy movements in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And next week is National Summer Learning Week. And we're celebrating summer learning next week, yep. So we'll be posting lots of in, uh, our activity guides and sharing stories that way too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us today. And a special thank you to our three presenters and have a great 4th of July. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you.